So I wanted to, um, I want just to update the audience as to uh, where we are up to in our three-year study in treating children with autism associated enterocolitis um, as we would treat anyone with an IBD. Uh, by we, I have myself and Dr. Stephen Walker at Wake Forest. And uh, this of course is done with the cooperation and support of the Brain Foundation and uh, we are greatly indebted to them as well. So I'm gonna run quickly through a number of slides and then I'm, I'm, I'll leave some time at the end for, uh, for questions. So basically you've heard, if you've been listening to the last number of weeks and, and lectures, uh, there is clearly a link between behaviors and cognition as you've even heard in the very last lecture. Um, and GI symptoms. So in other words, worse, the worse the GI symptoms, the worse the behaviors and cognition tend to be and vice versa. GI symptoms would normally consist of vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, abdominal pain. They could be delicate thrive for abdominal distension, vomiting, um, erectation, flatulence. But the articles that link the behaviors and cognition to GI symptoms uh, are they're limited in that it's the GI symptoms that they're linking to. Uh, what are the diagnoses? What are the etiologies? What are the causes of those GI symptoms? Because once you know the etiology, you can treat. Linking to a symptom makes it very difficult to appropriately treat. So just a very brief primer. I know it's associated enterocolitis. Um, we found that back in 2010, we published on this. It's, uh, we found an inflammatory, histologic inflammatory condition of the colon or small bowel in 70 to 75% of children with those specific GI symptoms. Uh, it is an autoimmune disease uh, at its very core. It is not a food allergy. It's not a result of the dysbiotic flora. We don't believe it is. Um, the many are looking into that now, and there certainly is a school of thought out there that uh, any inflammatory properties found in the mucosa of the intestine are a result of dysbiotic flora, but it is it's my strongly felt belief that um, the opposite is true, is that the autoimmune inflammatory state came first and because of the abnormal milieu that the inflammatory state creates, the flora that reside there become dysbiotic. But over, over the course of uh, the coming uh, the coming year or two or three, hopefully we'll have that sorted out. But certainly it's not a food allergy. Images of the colitis, um, the upper two images are from a colonoscopy. You see lack of, um, lack of the normal vasculature, uh, lack of normal pink color at the lower, uh, on the lower panel, you see this area of a focal invasion of lymphocytes. So it's a chronic colitis. Um, you also see uh, the bifid crypt over here, which is also a, a indicator uh, uh, of likely chronic inflammatory condition. Uh, using a capsule endoscopy, we, we find that there are erosions and ulcerations that are exudative uh, in various areas of the small bowel. On biopsy of the ileum, we find the neutrophilic infiltrate into the crypt. So this is a cryptitis of the ileum, which is an ileitis. So those are, those are the, uh, that's the cellular appearance of the intestine in the vast majority of children who have GI symptoms and autism. So <clears throat> we can describe their symptoms very quickly in terms of stool frequency. Um, we can, um, some of the kids have diarrhea, meaning they have 10 stools per day. Some of the kids have diarrhea, meaning that they have one stool per day, but it's always the texture of water. We describe the stool in terms of color, its odor, its volume. And when we are uh, describing the stools in this way, we are able to create very, very um, finely tailored questionnaires that are really adapted specifically to the issues that these kids are facing because the standard questionnaires, as you will soon see, have really been developed over the years um, and rely upon the patient to be able to describe their, their subjective feeling and experiences. That's an impossibility with a disease like autism. So we have to look at the small 
uh, at the small signs as opposed to symptoms. Uh, bowel movement descriptors, do they strain to pass stool? Are they grunting? Are their neck veins popping out? Is their face turning red? Do they go back and forth to the bathroom uh, multiple times, um, sitting down, up again, sitting down, up again, until finally the stool is passed? Looking for abdominal distension, distension, muscle mass deficiency, which is a very, very common problem, which is part of growth failure. Um, externalizing behaviors, which we know from experience uh, when patients who are having uh, a GI, an underlying GI disease, whether it be an ulcer or an inflammatory bowel disease, those are often manifest, uh, manifest as aggression, self-injury, self extremes of behavior, hyperactivity, irritability. Of course, not all aggression or self-injury is a consequence of a GI disturbance. You heard in the very last lecture, for example, that aggression and self-injury might be um, might be a consequence of a food or of a supplement uh, taken in the wrong dose. But certainly we know that uh, GI symptoms do cause these. Uh, internalizing behaviors, uh, heightened anxiety, depression, uh, rigidity, OCDs, compulsions, these are all the things we wanted to look at and try and uh, link to the presence or absence or of active inflammatory disease or the presence of the, any of these symptoms, any or all of these symptoms when the disease was active, meaning active GI symptoms and improvement in any or all of these symptoms as the uh, active disease was treated over the course of a year. So the research question that we wanna ask is does treating the ASD associated inflammatory bowel disease with induction corticosteroids followed by non-steroidal Aminosalicylic agents and immunomodulators of biologic therapy as clinically warranted. Does doing that help the GI symptoms? Does it help the diarrhea? Does it help the constipation? Does it help the abdominal distension? How about the cognition? How about the behavior? Are those, uh, are those improved as well? Our hypothesis is yes, we've seen this, we've experienced this um, with uh, countless patients. Uh, no published paper has yet addressed this. We are, and this is the study that we are in the process of doing. The impact of the study, the reason why this is such an important study that I've wanted to do for so many years is because if we can, if we can show that treating bowel, inflammatory bowel disease improves not just GI symptoms, but also cognition and behavior, then we have another offering to parents as another, uh, another way, another method, another modality to treat autism. Treating bowel disease will be able to say that treating bowel disease treats autism. So study designed very quickly. Um, we had to get a baseline. Uh, we created baseline GI surveys that we do online. Um, and this is the uh, survey which We'll show you in a different time, different place. Bowel movement chart, um, descriptions of the actual stool, and baseline externalizing behaviors. Things that behaviors that we've learned over the years are associated with uh, with GI disease. For example, passing a stool and while they're sitting on the toilet, they're stomping their feet, they're banging their walls, um, overly straining, they're bending way forward. Um, other behaviors, hyperactivity before a stool. Those are all behaviors that we know from experience are GR behaviors, and we wanted to be able to prove that uh, with this. The, um, we get a baseline. It takes five minutes to complete them. We also do baseline, baseline violin, the baseline SRS2, baseline autism behavioral checklist. And then at, um, at uh, the, the online GI questionnaires, we ask the, pa the parents to fill this out on a weekly basis. So at baseline and then weekly once treatment, once diagnosis of bay treatment begins. And that's a big ask. It's a big ask. And um, to our surprise, the vast majority of patients have kept up with it. And, um, and we can't thank them enough. Uh, at three months, we repeat the ABC at Six months, we repeat the ABC and the SRS, and nine months, the ABC by itself. And then finally, at the end of the one-year study, the one year of, uh, of oversight and observation, 
we do all three of the uh, social behavioral cognitive uh, testing again. And at the very baseline, uh, we do a molecular analysis of blood and tissue because again, these patients at the very, at the very beginning are, are undergo an endoscopy and a colonoscopy and a capsule endoscopy. We uh, obtain their blood. And we, uh, what we expect to find is that uh, pre-treatment baseline versus the end of the one year treatment for the IBD, we'll be seeing uh, different, uh, different molecular biomarkers in their blood, in their peripheral blood and in their, uh, in their inflamed GI mucosa. Okay, we're gonna skip this because we described it already. The hypothesis is that patients that were treated um, for their GI disease will have improvement in GI symptoms and they will also have improvement in behavior and cognition. And the important thing to say is that the improvement in behavior and cognition, what we've seen exceeds that which you would see a behavior improvement in behavior and cognition. It exceeds that which you would see from just feeling better. Because all of us, if we felt better would function better, but here the cognition in particular um, we see kids who, once their stools normalize, they, their communication, their use of words, uh, putting words together, all of a sudden you get that ability. Even if the kid's 11, 12 years old, and, and we thought that they were beyond the point that they would ever achieve that kind of milestone. So uh, these are things that uh, we have been seeing so far. The primary outcome measure, though, remains treating uh, bowel inflammation, does it help in their bowel symptoms? That's our primary outcome measure. The secondary outcome measures um, would mean that a concurrent improvement, as, we was, as we've been saying, with their, um, with their uh, concurrent improvement of GI symptoms together with cognition and behavior, also strongly implies that treatment of the bowel disease is a treatment for ASD. Um, and also, it would also validate that these behaviors that so many of the behavioralist folks uh, in the world of behavioral medicine um, uh, dismiss as autistic behaviors are in fact manifestations and symptoms of an underlying medical condition, whether it's gastrointestinal or another medical condition. And then of course, the characterization of the molecular markers at baseline and also at 52 weeks. So where are we right now in our study? So <clears throat> we, um, we spent the first half of 2019 uh, planning the study. Uh, we recruited our first patients in July of 2019, which involves uh, again, identifying patients who have autism, chronic GI symptoms that uh, clinically justify diagnostic endoscopy, colonoscopy consent. Uh, to take part in the research study, agreeing to fill out all those questionnaires. Um, we inventory their initial biopsies um, and blood samples. We uh, administer the three ASD questionnaires, the two GI questionnaires, we began treatment. Okay, that's the enrollment process. So currently in November of 2020, we have three subjects who already completed the full year, meaning they've gone through um, uh, baseline months th uh, three, six, nine, and twelve of their uh, of their um, of their autism evaluations, and they've done fifty-two weeks. They may have missed a week or two or three of their um, online uh, GI-based questionnaires. We have seventeen subjects at various stages of the fifty-two week period, most of them are at the uh, above 40 uh, week stage. Uh, eight subjects enrolled uh, continued treatment, but just have not been compliant in completing questionnaires. And, you know, even though it's, uh, you know, from those of us who do the research, but, you know, we're so interested in finding answers that we can, uh, we can use to be able to demonstrate a concept or to be able to roll out a therapy. It's hard and you want to be upset with people, uh, you know, who, who don't cooperate with the study, but, you know, certainly we, we, we can never be upset with them. Uh, their lives are, are, are so complicated. And um, the ask 
again in this study is it's a big one. It's it's a weekly, it's a, a weekly online uh, sheet, and the lives of these parents we understand is very very complex. We have a um, study coordinator who really does ch chase them down, um, texts them, emails them, calls them. Um, but uh, so those eight subjects um, will, will probably not be able to be included in our, in our final essay. Uh, we will have their final uh, blood and, and, uh, bi and the mucosal biopsy. And so we'll see what our statisticians can work out at the end. Nine subjects, interest interestingly, um, after the initial course of corticosteroids, they, they, dropped, they dropped out and stopped treatment. Um, that's one of the, uh, that's a clinical issue that we've had for many years that since the induction is done with corticosteroids, um, these patients by, by virtue of their having ASD, which is at least in part a psychiatric condition, steroids and psychiatric conditions don't always go, uh, go well together. And um, there are going to be some patients who even at the lower doses of steroids that we give, um, their level of hyperactivity uh, in response to even those low doses of steroids uh, really can, can, go, can go quite high. And um, some parents just get very scared when they see that and uh, they stop at that point. Um, and then two subjects enrolled uh, and um, never began treatment. They, they, they got their diagnosis of an inflammatory bowel disease and then moved on, which is always, uh, which, which we knew would happen before it's happened over the years. But this, you see, you see the gamut of, uh, of patients that we see clinically in, in a regular practice. So 39 patients actually enrolled, there are 20 active study patients. And uh, which are good numbers. Those are really, really good numbers. And uh, the fact that we had COVID during this time makes those numbers even better because for, for about four months, the surgical center was closed. So we, we couldn't enroll any new patients. And um, the fact that patients kept up with the questionnaires uh, during that point is really a, um, a testament uh, to, to the, the diligence of those patients. We anticipate for the next two years um, to have an additional 15 to 20 active enrollees, COVID allowing. Um, I will very hopefully start, see, uh, start seeing patients in the state of California. Um, as um, was mentioned before, and I'm hoping that that will allow us to, uh, to boost up the numbers. Uh, there, but even without that, I think we're going to have very good numbers. Uh, data analysis for those patients enrolled already uh, will begin starting the beginning of 2021, and it will be a uh, a multi-departmental involvement between a number of specialties. And of course, uh, item three of those pa those patients who've completed the requisite first year in the study are going to continue to be treated. Um, as they, because that, that would have been the case uh, had they not been in the study. And of course, we could do some post hoc analysis on that and see what other information we can get from that. Um, I'm going to stop here. I'm just going to do a thank you to the Brand Foundation for their ongoing support and encouragement. And uh, I really do mean that. Um, Pramila, in particular, has been uh, a really tremendous force uh, of. And, and a source of, of personal encouragement for me uh, and for Dr. Walker. The parents who really diligently complete the research questionnaires week after week, uh, we can't thank you enough. And uh, to Sidhu Srinivasan, Pramila's son, who did the layout of my slide presentation. He did not like my original layout and he insisted that he do it himself. And um, so, uh, if you have any complaints, they go to Sidhu. And if you have any compliments, they go to Sidhu as well. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Krigsman. And, you know, we, we know you for honoring um, the participants of your study, uh, the parents, the patients, and uh, the colleagues. Um, you are very generous. I have uh, a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first question is, do you believe it makes sense to explore the 
explore in detail the GI status of autistic children who have no signs of GI distress, but immune abnormalities? So, uh, yes, the answer is yes. I, I, I do believe that the GI tract of completely asymptomatic from a GI standpoint, autistic kids does hold many important clues. Um, the, uh, the limitation there is that you really can't do an invasive study or any study that involves even minimal risk on their GI tract unless there is an acknowledged indication. Um, so if you have a patient who has absolutely, on careful questioning, no GI symptom that would be an indication for an invasive evaluation under anesthesia, then of course you wouldn't be able to. There, there is the capsule endoscope now. The capsule endoscope is the, the pill cam, um, which really uh, is a minimal, minimal, minimal risk, uh, not zero risk, nothing's ever zero. Uh, and that, you know, that's something that we can see, can conceivably get an IRB approval to use, uh, to use that as an imaging as an imaging source in older ASD kids who are able to swallow. Perfect. The second question, Dr. Krixman, is what percentage of ASD patients in your clinical practices who are completely non-speaking have developed speech after such GI treatment? Any ballpark estimate? So that's, uh, that's a hard question to answer because developing speech, we have to first define what that means. The, uh, I, I would say that the majority, 70 to 80% are become communicative in some way or another, meaning whereas they were non-communicative at baseline, they became communicative either in uh, words, whether it's a single word or two or three words put together, or uh, they don't become verbal, but they become able to type or to use a letter board. Um, and uh, that's something, and then the ones who use the letter board are often much more communicative than the ones who speak uh, because, and I'm sure that many of you have seen this with your own children or patients, or your patients you know, that you know of, um, some of the kids who do the, uh, you know, the other uh, RPM or rapid prompting or other methods of typing on a keyboard, write the most beautiful poetry and prose and expressive sentences, but are not able to do that using words. Um, so my answer, my answer to my rephrased question um, is that the vast majority become significantly more communicative. Perfect. Next question, Dr. Christman, is does enterocolitis run in families of these autistic kids? Uh, no, that's not a common thing. We have found it. We have found Crohn's and colitis in the family, but what we, uh, what we very often find is, is, a, is an autoimmune disease in the first degree relative. So the mother with Hashimoto's and the child with autism and the enterocolitis or the uh, or the uncle uh, with uh, multiple sclerosis and uh, the niece or nephew with ASD and, and, and an enterocolitis. And that's, that's been published also, but the, um, the enterocolitis, the, there, there is a publication um, from, from Mass General a couple of years ago that, that Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, those, those diagnostic codes occur more commonly in ASD children than in non-ASD children. Now I was, when I was looking back at the, at, the, um, at the discharge codes used at the hospital in the, in the pediatric uh, section of the hospital. So there's clearly, there's clearly an, uh, an, an IBD, uh, a recognizable IBD uh, that occurs more commonly in ASD than not in ASD. But when you look at the ASD that we're speaking about here, which would not be called Crohn's disease, the numbers just uh, enlarge exponentially. Perfect. And um, 
One question is, um, can San Francisco Bay Area patients sign up for this study? Absolutely. Um, you know, the way to sign up for the study is, is if, you, if you're a, a parent of a child who has autism and GI symptoms, and the GI symptoms are unexplained by conventional methods, then that child, uh, that child deserves to have a, uh, a diagnostic endoscopy and a biopsy. And if inflammation is found, then they become a candidate for this study. And we have patients from Northern California, uh, from really all over the country that are involved in the study. So, so the answer is yes. Perfect. Is the inflammation you see more like IBS or IBD? So IBS doesn't really have inflammation. IBS is almost a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, there are some biomarkers recently published, but for the most part, uh, it's a diagnosis of exclusion where you don't find any, uh, anything to treat, but the symptoms are specific. Um, that's called IBS. The, uh, we're talking specifically here about IBD. And the IBD is something which is much more easily treated than IBS. And the medications that we use normally for Crohn's disease are very effective in treating this variant of inflammatory bowel disease.